So far we've talked about three steps in doing a hazardous waste determination. Step four is maybe the one that will be the easiest for us to get our hands around. It's the sort of thing that we are most commonly thinking of when we think hazardous waste. So that fourth step is do we have a characteristic hazardous waste? Another way to put it is do we have a, a waste that's hazardous and regulated because it has some specific dangerous property. There are four different dangerous properties that we're concerned with. The first is ignitability, things that catch fire easily. Second is corrosivity. Third is something referred to as reactivity. And then lastly, toxicity. And you'll notice there are different waste codes for each of these four characteristics, starting with the letter D. Now, if you want to help yourself remember what these four different characteristics are, because, say, oh, you're taking an exam on hazardous waste, remember ICRT. I can remember that. All right, let's look at each of these four characteristics, starting with ignitability. The waste code for something that's ignitable is D001. And we say something is a regulated ignitable waste if it catches fire very easily. But the big question is, how easily do we mean when we say very easily? Well, we have a lab test that actually tells us how ignitable something is. It's called the flashpoint test. Basically, they take a liquid waste and they put it in a metal cup and they heat it up so that more vapors will come off of it. The more you heat it up, the more vapors will evaporate from the liquid. While they're heating up the liquid, they're trying to set it on fire with a small flame or barbecue igniter-like device. If at some point they heat it up enough so that there are enough vapors coming off the liquid that when they try to set it on fire, it does, it flashes the vapors, they say they've reached the flash point. They look at the temperature of that liquid, and if it is less than 140 degrees Fahrenheit, then we consider it to be an ignitable hazardous waste. Now, it's also possible for solids to be hazardous for ignitability. We say, essentially, that if something, if it's able to catch fire by friction, and then once it catches fire, it really takes off, it's considered to be an ignitable solid waste. If USDOT refers to a waste as a flammable gas, then we would say that is an ignitable waste. If USDOT considers a waste to be an oxidizer, we again would call it an ignitable hazardous waste. Remember, it has to be a waste, not a product. If you're still going to use it, we would not regulate it. Here's a couple of symbols to help you identify in your building if you have materials that may be oxidizers or flammable gases. If you see these symbols, just ask questions. Is it a waste? If so, we may regulate it. Our second characteristic is corrosivity. Something with a very high pH that we would call caustic or a very low pH that we would call a strong acid. Things that are corrosive carry a waste code of D002. And we say that if it is beyond a pH range of 2 to 12 and a half, we would consider it to be regulated. So an acid that has a pH of less than or equal to 2 would be a D002 corrosive hazardous waste. If it is a caustic with a pH greater than or equal to 12 and a half, we would say it is a regulated corrosive hazardous waste. It's also possible in New Hampshire to have something called a corrosive solid. Remember that picture I showed you earlier of the white powder, that, the container that had rusted on the damp basement floor? Well, that white powder that was spilling out was a corrosive material. 
If it had been mixed 50-50 with water and the pH measured, it would have been either higher than or equal to 12 and a half or less than or equal to 2. A corrosive hazardous waste. Here's just some pictures to help you kind of understand or, or more easily visualize what a corrosive waste is. On the left, some symbols you may look th for throughout your facility. On the right is a sample of a pH range for some common materials you may come across. Lemon juice has a pH of around 2. A pH of 12.5 is somewhere between ammonia and lye. So some pretty aggressive chemicals that you are, are looking at there. Our third characteristic is reactivity. One way to think of reactivity is things that like to go boom. So if it's something that's inherently unstable, maybe shock sensitive, likely it's reactive. If it is a waste that reacts badly with water or air, we would say that is reactive as well. Now a lot of chemicals don't get along with each other. For instance, you wouldn't think to mix ammonia and bleach because we've all been told it creates dangerous chlorine gas and can kill you. But if you have a chemical that's dangerous in contact with water or air, think how difficult it is to avoid those two things. So for that reason, we regulate these reactive wastes rather strictly. Another reason a waste could be reactive is because of its uh, high content of cyanides or hydrogen sulfides, or if USDOT has considered it a forbidden explosive, things like dynamite that are wastes, we would consider reactive hazardous wastes. On the left, a symbol you may see to help you identify something as reactive, and on the right, a couple containers of a material that is water reactive. We have two metals potassium and sodium, that if they come in contact with water and air, they can burn or even explode. If you come across a container of material that's packed in oil, that may be a good indicator to you that something is water or air reactive. Our last characteristic is toxicity things that are dangerous to human health or the environment. In our rules, there are 39 different metals and chemicals that we are concerned with if they are above a particular regulated concentration. The way that the concentration of these regulated materials is found is using a laboratory test known as the Toxicity Characteristic Leaching Procedure, or TCLP, also called the T-clip. The way this test is designed is to try and identify what would happen if your waste was placed in a landfill. In New England, you get mildly acid rain, lands on the ground, percolates down through the soil, perhaps gets a little bit more acidic on the way, and then when it gets to your waste buried in the ground, it's going to leach or strip out some of the bad stuff that's in that waste. It'll continue to carry it down through the soil until it gets to groundwater, where it may be drawn up by someone's drinking well. So for that reason, that risk that it will be ingested through groundwater, we have very low limits on these toxicity characteristic constituents. If you were to look at the rules in the table, you would find these in the same area of the rules, part 400 by turning ahead past the K list, you would see the 39 different metals and chemicals. Waste code listed in the left column, the name of the material we're regulating in the second, and in the fourth column is the concentration at which it becomes a hazardous waste when tested with the TCLP. And if you look, let's say at the first example, barium is regulated at 100 parts per million, or 100 milligrams per liter. That's essentially the same when you're dealing with hazardous waste milligrams per liter is virtually the same as parts per million. 
But if you read down through that table, you will see some of those concentrations are very low. Lead is regulated at five parts per million. Cadmium at one part per million. Some pesticides at just a fraction of a part per million. So knowing what is in your waste and being able to identify whether something could be there at a very, very low concentration will be a challenge for you. But you need to know. You need to be able to identify what constituents, what contaminants are in your waste stream. You're the business that chooses to use these materials, that chooses to do this process. Who should know more about this material than you? Thank you.